Hello, NAS 4983, Intro to Language Revitalization. This is your instructor, Amy, Amy Lyons Ketchum, and I am here today to talk about the Module 4 Lecture Slides, uh, Language Policy and Language Planning. You can watch these in any order. So I'm going to start today with Language Policy. So what is language policy? So language policy are the theories, principles, laws, programs, measures, and acts uh, designed to manage one or more languages in a country. So what does this mean? So language policy is any law, any act, any declaration, any government sponsored program and that could be national government state government tribal government provincial government uh, local government um, programs um, and in addition to that the principles and theories that are related to how and when languages can be used or taught or um, promoted in a particular area. So what does that look like? Um, I'll have some examples later, but for example, a big one for Native American languages is the 1990 Esther Martinez Native American Languages Act. That is a piece of language policy. Um, other examples, and like I said, we'll have more in the presentation. Um, Let's say that um, a town decided to declare um, a certain day um, as um, French Day or Spanish Day or Cherokee Day, something like that. Even though it doesn't affect most people, it, it's not a law, um, but it's just like a declaration, um, that would be a piece of language policy. So why is there a need for language policy? Why do we need to have theories, principles, laws, programs, measures, and acts um, designed to manage one or more languages in the country? Well, um, the big reason why there's a need for language policy is language rights. So um, usually when you have speakers of more than one language in a particular area, um, one language might get um, used more than the other or promoted more than the other or preferenced more than the other. And so language policy tries to help um, equalize that and give minority languages um, some rights. Um, in a situation where a country or a, a region has been colonized, um, language policy might um, restrict use of the local language in preference of the colonial language um, or vice versa. It might um, bring the local language on equal or um, higher footing than the colonial language. Another reason for um, language policy it's really, um, especially here in the United States, freedom of speech. So you have the right as an American citizen to um, not say anything you want, but to, to definitely exercise your freedom of speech. And there's no restriction on what language that needs to be done in. The Constitution does not set English as a national language. So every... Um, Everything that falls under speed, uh, freedom of speech in English should also fall under in Spanish and French and uh, Cherokee and Potawatomi and Chickasaw, so like all of the languages. Um, a big reason that there is language policy is for education, guaranteeing the right to be educated in a certain language. Um, if you can probably think of here in the United States, we, the vast majority of schools are in English. Um, there are definitely bilingual schools um, all over the country, even here in Oklahoma. Um, and we also have the option to take classes in certain languages. And it's a requirement um, in many universities, 
uh, even in many high schools that um, students study a language other than English. And so it is language policy that has set these rules and, and allowed for education to be in other languages. We have a handful of immersion schools in the United, in Oklahoma, I mean. And so, um, for example, the Cherokee Immersion School, it was an act of language policy that allowed that to be happen and for those students to um, study in the Cherokee language and then receive the same um, degree that someone who studied just in English did. Another reason for language policy is services. So if you've ever looked before at a census document or some tax forms, um, you can get them translated in dozens and dozens of different languages. And um, the reason for that is that this is a service that is being offered because everyone is encouraged to complete the census, regardless of what language they speak, what their immigration status is, what um, their, you know, religious status, all of that. So it is offered in multiple languages as a service. Um, in countries where there's more than one official language, a lot of time, um, all services must be offered in those multiple languages. For example, if I lived in Canada, and I was a French speaking Canadian and I got pulled over and arrested in the English speaking part of Canada. Um, I have the right to an attorney and my attorney must also um, be a French speaker. I'm not stuck with just a English speaking attorney that they would have to find someone who could communicate with me in French if that was my language because those are the two official languages of Canada. Um, and then another reason, and a reason that we're probably the most interested in language policy is for reversing language shift. So we learned that language shift is when a group of people um, move from one language to another. Um, and we are here to reverse that. We are um, working in language revitalization so that we can bring people back to their first language. Uh, to their indigenous language, their heritage language. And one way that that can be accomplished is through language policies, laws and acts and uh, different um, declarations that promote language use. So some examples of language policy. So all of these are links. I highly recommend that you guys click on these links. The first one is I think the most important and you should definitely know this for the module four quiz. The 1990 Native American Languages Act, also known as the Esther Martinez Act. And so we're, we're pulling it up here online. This is a link to it. So the Native American Languages Act of 1990 established federal policy to allow the use of Native American languages as the medium of instruction in schools and affirms the right of Native American children to express themselves, be educated, and assessed in their own native language. So this is an act. It is federal policy. This means it was voted on and passed through Congress. And then uh, what it does is it makes it possible for Native American languages to be the medium of instruction in schools. So not taught as a foreign language, but the primary language. So this allows things like immersion schools and bilingual schools. It also affirms the right of Native children to express themselves, be educated, and assessed in their own language. So that means they cannot be discriminated against for using their native languages. So this is a, a in the law reversal of some of the um, boarding school era policies that uh, did not allow native children to express themselves, be educated and be assessed in their languages. So this goes on and talks more about the history of the program, um, where it comes from, and uh, gives you some background on this particular law. Next, we have the Official Languages Act of Canada. So um, as you know, there's quite a few um, First Nation 
um, tribes in Canada, and we know that Canada has um, English and French as official languages. So this requires, this act from 1969 requires all federal institutions in Canada, again, to provide services in English or French on request. Oh, I'm sorry, that's what um, make it. This act was passed on the recommendation of the Loyal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. And um, it created the Office of the Commissioner of Official Languages, which oversees its implementation. And so it goes on and talks about how French or English are the official languages for parliament and government. And it goes on and describes the value of statutory and other instruments. So this Official Languages Act put French and English as the two national languages of Canada, but it did not talk about any of the native languages in Canada. So it would be interesting to see if there, since 1969, have been um, more laws, uh, more language policies, I should say, that promote native language use in Canada. So this uh, next one is about New Zealand. And uh, sometimes when I try to open this one, uh, you might get a weird block. For some reason I did the first time, but I didn't. But this bill um, sets at least 10 national priority languages for schools um, in New Zealand. And one of those being Te Reo Maori, which is the indigenous language of um, New Zealand and New Zealand Sign Language as official languages in New Zealand. Chinese language policy. So this website doesn't, um, like the other ones kind of show um, the text of different bills and um, where they came about. This one just kind of talks more in general about Chinese language policy. Um, and how um, China's national identity is really tied into their language policy. China is a very, very big place, and it would make sense that there are a lot of regional languages, especially in very remote places. We know about Mandarin Chinese, and you may have heard of Cantonese. Um, and then there's other languages in China. However, um, China has really kind of promoted one people, one culture um, kind of um, philosophy and languages, unfortunately, that are not majority languages have been really discouraged. So this talks a little bit about that. Um, language education policy in South Africa. So this is interesting because in South Africa, the official policy is that schools um, have to teach in English or Afrikaans, which Afrikaans is a kind of weird version of Dutch um, that the people who colonized South Africa spoke. Um, however, what actually happens is students are presented a lot of information in Afrikaans and in English. However, the teachers do a lot of the nitty gritty of, of explaining concepts in their native languages, in their African dial, uh, languages and dialects from the region. Um, and sometimes that's easy and sometimes that's hard. For example, the article talks about how for science teachers, it's really hard to do complex science lessons in the indigenous languages. They just don't have the vocabulary standardized to be able to talk about certain things. So it's not that the teachers are unable to speak those languages, they're just really unable to discuss in detail some of the concepts. Whereas in, in uh, English or in Afrikaans, they're able to discuss, you know, things like the cell life cycle um, or, you know, how photosynthesis works uh, because there's easier vocabulary for describing it. But some things like mathematics and, and some other subjects, it's, it's a lot easier and so um, the teachers are able to use that 
for the most part. And they find that students actually learn better in their native language or at least in a mixture of the languages. And so here is a link to um, some information about Irish language policy. Um, this is download, so when you click on it, it's gonna bring up this document. And so what they've done here is this is a 20 year plan for the Irish language. So the other lecture in this um, section is about uh, language planning and a lot of policy comes from language planning and this is a in-depth plan about all of the policies that are going to be implemented and strengthened and or phased out for um, the Irish language and this is you know a government document and so it has a very detailed plan about the establishment of schools and education in different parts of the country. The Gale Talk are the um, far, far western parts of Ireland that still a majority of people use Irish on a daily basis. So maybe they will need um, different support than in some of the areas that there are far fewer um, Irish speakers. Um, and it just kind of goes on and talks about, you know, from primary school all the way through. Um, and not just in school, but here they're talking about media and technology coming up with Irish words for things so they don't have to talk, switch to English. Um, and all these areas for um, action. One of your projects for this class is you're going to create a language program and we'll talk about this more starting in module five but this is a document that could kind of let you see what all is is possible um, for a language plan okay so those are some examples of language policies there are good language policies and poor language policies. So um, a prime example of a bad language policy is the boarding school era. And this did not just happen in North America. Um, it's very possible we pioneered it, which is horrible. But at the same time, it's been done all over the world and had very similar effects all over the world. This is a document from the United Nations about indigenous peoples and boarding schools and all the different places this has happened and um, some of the places that are still doing this and um, kind of some of, of what happened from the boarding school era. Um, U.S. foreign language education policy is some of the worst language policy. Here in the United States, oh, this is a bad link. I apologize for that. Um, U.S. foreign language education policy is some of the worst in that we are introduced to um, foreign languages way too late to become effective learners. In places like China and Japan, um, students start in elementary school learning English. Is everyone who graduates from high school fluent in English? By no means. But you have a much better chance, especially if you have a natural talent or if you have an interest in a language, the younger you start learning it. So we should be teaching, you know, um, we should have bilingual Chinese schools and bilingual Arabic schools and bilingual um, Persian um, Farsi schools. Because even if only one in 10 students that go to those schools becomes proficient in the language, then those are more people that can work in national security, that can work in the military, that can work in um, government and, and bridge the gaps. And then another um, example of really oops, poor um, language policies are blank language only laws. So think of English only laws. So we're gonna tell people that you can't use a language other than English um, in public spaces and things like this. These are often poorly planned um, pieces of language policy and they don't do anything but shame and discriminate for the most part. Um, there are much more effective ways to um, promote English use with um, 
uh, with immigrants and others. So language planning, and this is going back to the other um, PowerPoint, are measures taken by official agencies to influence the use of one or more languages uh, in a particular speech community. And so there's macro level and micro level. So language planning can happen at the government level and it can happen at the community level. So examples of happening at the macro level, we saw that Irish report on um, language policies. That is a big national level. A micro level language planning would be something like a school saying, we're gonna have a language fair at our school or um, even a classroom at a school saying that we are going to make Tuesday Spanish day, something like that. So language planning is really just someone making a plan to influence the use of languages in their area and that can happen at a small level and at a large level. Okay, so this page talks about language planning and policy types and approaches. And so it breaks it down about the status um, planning. So um, is this an official language? Um, is this a second language? Um, acquisition planning. So how are people going to learn this language? Corpus planning. So this is um, how, you know, what kind of materials are we going to have in the language? And this goes on and talks about, you know, um, a approach and um, how it kind of ends up. So this is from a book about language policy and planning that I have that, that really goes in depth about how to make change through government with language policy. Okay. So language policy policy is really just the laws and acts and official things any government, large or small, does to promote or restrict or even um, just recognize different languages in their area. So one thing that how this relates to our class is if you plan to work in the field of language revitalization, being familiar with what language policy is and how to create language policy um, is really important for your tribal government or the state government or for the national government so that we can protect um, people's language rights and um, their freedom of speech. How this relates to our class assignments wise is starting in module five, we're going to create our own language program. And like I said, we'll discuss this in much more detail, but one aspect of your language program will be a policy so you will create some language policy that allows your language program to take place. And to practice that for the module four discussion, um, I ask you to create a hypothetical piece of language policy. And I give an example where um, I create a um, resolution in the state that recognizes um, 38 indigenous languages as um, official languages of the state of Oklahoma and what that entails. Your discussion for this module is going to be a practice for um, when you start planning your language program. Um, one of the first things you'll have to do is create a piece of policy, language policy, that allows your program to take place. And then you will do language planning of what your program is going to look like. And then, um, you know, you'll train teachers and you'll set up a curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll do this um, all together as a class. So be thinking about language policies different acts and laws and resolutions and how they affect our use of languages. Okay, 
Thanks, guys. See you in the next one.